Hey, good morning, Family Church. Pastor Craig, I'm sorry my voice is a little bit of a wreck as I'm coming off a cold, but I hope that you're ready to get into God's Word and continue in Psalm 51. And I want to start today with a question, and the question is very simple. Um, Have you ever been caught? You know what I mean. Have you ever been caught? Maybe it was a lie, and someone caught you just right there, and they're like, hey, wait a minute, they call you out, or Maybe it's uh, that text or that email. You hit send and then automatically realize it's going to somebody that it was not intended to and and there's that sinking feeling. Or maybe maybe you've been caught cheating or stealing or or something happened to the point where you get that gut-wrenching, oh no feeling. I've been caught. Uh, It's a miserable feeling. And uh, we often find ourselves in those places when we begin to steer away from what God would have for us. But I have another question. Have you ever been forgiven? If you were ever caught, did you ever find forgiveness from the one you harmed? When I was uh, 16 years old, I don't want to brag, but I was a bit of an air guitarist. I was really good on the air guitar. You know, you don't actually have the guitar, you just play the air. And I was really good. Like, you would think I knew how to play guitar. In fact, I could pick up a broom and play along with any song there was. And I desperately wanted to play guitar. And I had a dream about it. I thought, I could do this. The problem was I didn't have a guitar. And I really wanted to play electric guitar. I wanted to be really good. But with no guitar and no amp and no way to play the music, I was at a loss. And so, unfortunately, I decided that I would begin to accumulate all the parts needed to play guitar someday. And I walked into a store. It's kind of like a little mom and pop store, used items. And, uh, and I helped myself to a guitar cable. This was the cable that would connect a guitar I didn't own to an amplifier I didn't own. And I thought, this is part number one. And I put it in my pocket and I walked out of the store with it. And I was feeling pretty good about it. Not too much guilt, but, you know, I I pulled it off. Nobody caught me and I drove home. And I don't remember how the circumstances came about, but within a few days, all I know is I had been caught. I received a phone call or a friend told me. I, I don't recall how that all came about, but all I knew was I had two days to return the item or the police were going to be called. And, and I had that gut sinking feeling. And so I collected the item and I was on my way out the door to return it. And my mom, of all things, says, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm just going into town. She goes, I want to go with you. Thanks. That's just great, mom. Uh, I couldn't believe that mom was in the car and I'm driving back to the store and I enter the store and now I've got to get mom away from me so I can return the item and hey mom why don't you go over there and so I quickly go up to the store owner and I said hey I've I've got the thing that I stole and I'm really sorry and I handed it back and they looked at me and to my surprise they didn't yell at me they said thank you thank you for bringing it back you see this is how we make money and when you took that from us you took our ability to pay bills and feed our family And I said, I was sorry. And they said, we're glad you brought it back. You did do the right thing, but don't ever come back into our store again, understandably. And so at this point, I just want out. I just want out of the store. And I'm like, mom, let's go. And of course, she's confused. We just got here. I want to look around. I said, nah, let's go to a different store. Let's head out of here. And so we're walking out of the store and the store owner stops us. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm dead. Now it's all coming to light. It's going to happen. She's going to tell my mom what I did. And to my surprise, the store owner looked at my mom and said, you have a good boy there. And that has stuck with me. I believe this was God reaching through this person to say, don't live this life. And that was the end of my life of crime. I was done stealing stuff. And I, I walked out of, the door, out of the door of that office that business, and I just, I felt forgiven. Like, I knew I wouldn't come back to the store, but I felt relieved. It was, it was over. And in our story, we've been walking with David in his psalm of repentance. Remember, David, he was uh, confronted by the prophet Nathan, who God sent by the power of the Spirit to convict him. 
to confront him and accuse him of the sin that David had done. Remember the sin that he had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba, which produced a child. He, he was part of adultery and lying and covering up and deceit, ultimately plotting to help her husband Uriah ultimately be killed in the front lines of battle. And in this psalm of repentance, we hear this heart of David just crying out to God, realizing that that gut feeling is that he had sinned against God. And this is a a troubling time for him. But I want to remind us as we go into this, this is a poem, a, a psalm of repentance. And like David, who was fully known and fully loved, you and I too have that incredible gift of God to be fully known and yet fully loved. And so I want to get into Psalm 51 and remind us the definition of repentance. This is the foundation we started this study with, that it's a remorseful turning away from sin to God. This idea that what I did is truly wrong and I feel it in my body and in my heart. And I'm turning from that and I want to return back to you, God. So I'm going to continue in verse 7 of Psalm 51 as we begin to see a shifting as David has laid out his heart and his sin and confessed his sin and now seeks for restoration. And so let's begin in verse 7. He writes by saying, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. As David writes this, we have this commingling of the, the true uh, personhood of David, his personality, his brokenness, and yet the filling of the Spirit as he writes. And the Spirit not only affirms to him that this is possible, what we're going to walk through today, this, this idea of salvation, but also that for you and I, we have a hope that is incredible in the gospel that the work that Jesus did is what we look to. And that work, as they were a thousand years before Jesus came looking to the coming Messiah, we have this incredible gift. And I want to walk through that with you today. And I hope that you see through his writing the seriousness of the condition that David realizes he is in. There is a seriousness. And he begins with this plant in his, his writing. He talks about hyssop. He starts, he says, to Purge me with hyssop. Now, now hyssop is an an interesting uh, plant that shows up throughout Scripture. And it's known to be very fragrant. It's also known to have healing properties. You know, ailments of the stomach and things that can soothe. But it's also the plant that was used back in the story, you might remember, when Israel was about to flee Egypt, that they were commanded to take hyssop and, and to spread the blood on the doorposts And as the Lord came over, he would pass over the homes, seeing them as forgiven and and able to be free. We also see that priests would use this for purification ceremonies and cleansing ceremonies before they would enter into the temple. And hyssop had a, a purifying thought and quality to it. And ultimately, we see Jesus on the cross, and he's given a sponge of a vinegar wine on the stalk of hyssop. And it's shortly right after that that he utters his last breath and declares, it is finished. David knows the significance and the Holy Spirit directing carries the significance of this plant as a cleansing property. And so I want to talk today about what it means to be pure. And so I want to point out the concept and the idea today starting with gospel purity gospel purity. Some of you hear purity and you think about sexual purity, and that's as far as your brain goes because it's not a common word we use outside of that. But we're going to talk about it from a complete cleansing, complete through and through, that a kind of cleansing that only God can do and that the finished work on the cross made available for me and you. 
This, this complete cleansing. Now, if I grabbed a glass of water and it was pure water and you drank it, you would say, this is good. But if I went out in the yard and grabbed some of the dog remnants and I walked up and I said, how much can I add to this cup? And you'd still be okay with it. Most of you would say, uh, don't put even a speck in there. I want pure water. I don't want tainted water with your dog presence. <laughs> That's what we're talking about, this idea that it's a purity, a gospel purity. And look at what David's desire is. He desires to be made pure, to be clean. And so look at his words. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The emphasis here, I want you to pay attention. Let's not miss it. He says, purge me. In other words, God, do what only you can do because I'm helpless here. God, purge me. And then he says, wash me. God, do what only you can do. And then I will be whiter than snow. You know, you and I take this for granted, snow. Um, You know, we're just in Cambodia. Those people don't see snow. In fact, I was there in January. It was cold here and I forgot it was winter here in Oregon. But for you and I this week, we had snow. At my house, we had about four inches. And I love the beauty of snow. Snow has this great attribute. It covers up a multitude of problems in the yard. Like there's this stump in my yard that I cut off the tree of, and the remnant is still there. And it was gone for a little while. And it was covered with just pure white beauty. And of course, during the rainy season, it's a little tough to pick up all the dog remnants. And they were covered up. And when you walk out and you see the trees decorated with this just beautiful white on the leaves and on the branches, it's just an incredible view that we see the beauty. But he's not just talking about an outward, it looks nice. He's referring to a depth. And you and I, when we read this and we say, shall be whiter than snow, clean me, I'll be whiter than snow. We know what snow looks like. And you have a unique perspective that some in the world don't have. But you understand what pure snow looks like. The snow that's not been touched. The snow you can pick up and eat. We used to take it and add uh, vanilla and sugar and make like a, an ice cream out of it. That's the kind of purity we're talking about. It's, it's untainted. And so David says, purge me and wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. And then he he says, let me hear joy and gladness. In other words, God, I have been tormented inside. I am struggling here. Bring back joy to my life. Bring back gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. And when, when I first read this, it's kind of, it's a play on words, right? This is a poem. And I was reflecting back and I saw um, kind of a reference to verse or to Psalm 32, David writing again. Let me just read something that I think adds to the thought here. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. But listen to what he says in Psalm 32. On verse three, he says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning day all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. He's using the poetic uh, kind of symbolism to say, the oppression of my sin was crushing me. It was as if it was breaking my bones and God lifted this pressure from me. Restore to me joy. Restore to me gladness. Do you hear the heaviness of his circumstance? Have you ever felt the heaviness of your circumstances, the weight of your sin? Well, see, gospel purity, if you go to Isaiah, is stated a similar way, but look what it says in Isaiah. It says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. This is the Lord speaking. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall become like wool. What an incredible moment as God declares, if you would come to me, I will purge you. I will cleanse you. I will make things right. I will remove this burden over you. I'm so grateful that we can have gospel purity. And for you and me, that means that we can come to Jesus and surrender fully to Him. And what we receive in our cleansing is no more guilt. 
Because of what Christ did, you and I don't have to feel guilty anymore. Like when I walked out of the store, even though I had done wrong, I returned the item, and the owner looks at my mom and says, he's a good boy. I don't deserve that. I was not a good boy. But I walked out free of the guilt of that. I felt as if I was released. You see, gospel purity means there's no more shame for the things that I've done to people or the things done to me. And finally, there's no more condemnation for those in Christ. No longer will your sin be held against you. That Jesus has taken that from you. That's gospel purity. 100% removal of sin. Wow. I hope that begins to restore joy to your face. I hope you're, you're smiling internally and even externally going, that's incredible. This is such a gift. God, why would you be so gracious to me? Why would you be so gracious? The second thing I want to press into today in David's writings is the idea of gospel righteousness. Gospel righteousness. This, this very idea that Jesus said, look, I took on the sin of the world and was treated like a sinner so that you could be treated as righteous. This gospel righteousness, as David presses in, look at his words, he says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit with me. Renew a right spirit, God. Clean me. I want to be in line and in step with your ways again. I want to have my relationship, God, restored back to what it was designed to be. Created me a right spirit. I want to be fully devoted to you. Do you remember last week, Pastor Drew, if you missed the message, I encourage you to go back and watch, but, but he was walking through the psalm and there's this statement that David says when he says, against you and only you, God, have I sinned. And I think Pastor Drew did a great job of, of making the, the point. It wasn't that people around him weren't harmed by the sin. In fact, Bathsheba had problems as a result of this. Her husband was killed. There are soldiers who died as a result of his deception. There's, there's untold, broken relationships. But as I was kind of reflecting and preparing, I thought about this. You know, you and I, we could spend our entire time on earth doing everything possible, and if it was possible, to attain perfect relationship with everybody, if that was possible. If you and I in our own energy could go to those we've harmed, confess, and restore relationships to perfect trust and perfect unity, even if that was possible, we still have a problem. You see, even though we harmed people in our sin or, or did injustice to others, we still ultimately have sinned against God. And David cries out, he says, restore this, create in me this clean heart, God. Clean my heart. Renew the spirit within me to have a right spirit, a righteous spirit. You see, even in that relationship, if we could somehow do this perfect relationship restoration on earth, we still have the greatest relationship is a problem if we don't come to the Lord. If we don't come to Christ, we are still broken. And so the psalmist David, he cries out, and I want to remind you of how this impacts us today. This is good gospel righteousness. Look what it says in 1 John 1.9. It says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let that soak in for a moment. You see, when we have given our life to Christ, when we look to the cross, the finished work, when we surrender fully, and when we confess, it says He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from what unrighteousness? It said all. Once again, 100%. All unrighteousness. And David longed for that. And he asked God, please, restore this spirit in me. Restore the relationship that I severed. Restore what only you can restore, God. Bring me back together. 
The next thing I'd like to focus on is the idea of gospel joy. Because I think that it's a building moment. I think we have this gospel purity as a result of the work of Christ. When we placed our faith in Him, He declared us righteous. So we have gospel righteousness. And then ultimately, it should lead to gospel joy that wells up within us day after day. The reminder that I didn't just need Jesus five years ago, ten years ago, whenever that day was that you surrendered to Him. I need Him today at this very moment. And so David continues this desire. You see, you and I do have a problem. If we don't understand what joy is, then we can get lost in what I'm going to share. You see, we often associate joy as happiness, and they're very different. See, happiness is that moment-to-moment emotion. We can be in pursuit of happiness all the time, looking for the next great thing that makes me feel really good. So for example, if if you walked in and said, Craig, I have a brand new Toyota Tacoma for you. And I'm like, what do you mean? I said, it's yours. Here's the keys. There's only one mile on it just to get it off the trailer and up the hill to you. It's yours. Man, I'll tell you, there would be happiness. Like, I can't believe it. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to do that, by all means, feel free to purchase a Toyota truck on my behalf. Oh, and deliver it to me, not for you. (laughs) But just think about what that would be like for you. Someone brings you a new truck, you're like, oh, yes. And you get in the truck and you drive five minutes later and you total it. Uh, That is not going to be happiness anymore. It's going to be sorrow. Hopefully, no broken bones. It's that very object, that truck brought me happiness and it brought sorrow. But joy is the gospel joy. It's a peace and hope fueled by the Holy Spirit despite my circumstances. Gospel joy is peace and hope fueled by the Holy Spirit despite my circumstances. And joy isn't about being ignorant in the hard times or being foolish in the good times, but it is a stability that says, beyond my circumstances, I have something so much better. Gospel joy. And so David continues in verse 11 he says cast me not away from your presence and take not your holy spirit from me this is a a heavy moment you see in the old testament we have to remember that the holy spirit was given to people for specific purposes for specific times given to kings given to prophets and david You might remember if you went back to 1 Samuel, witnessed and was around when King Saul was removed from his kingship and the Holy Spirit taken from him and given to David. See, I think David is very aware what life is like without the Spirit and very aware of what the Spirit in his life can do. I wonder if you've given your life to Christ and experienced the Holy Spirit, have you forgotten what it's like that you have the Spirit of God in you? Have you become a little bit complacent perhaps or forgotten that this is the the guider of your life, the, the director of all the decisions that he would love to make through you? Well, David says, don't take this from me. God, don't remove this. You see, when I have your Holy Spirit, you are with me and I am with you. As he says, cast me not away from your presence. He goes on and he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Have you ever found yourself struggling with joy? I I think for those that don't yet know the Lord, who have not yet received Christ as their Savior, They seek this through happiness. They try to find something that they know is missing, ultimately what only God can give. But when you come to Christ, we also have a problem. I I think oftentimes we find Christians that try to live as close to the world as possible and in the world, but still maintain joy. You ever found yourself asking that question, is this too far? Or maybe experiencing what feels like a removal of joy? Like, where are you? Have you ever struggled with that? You see, 
Chuck Smith, he's a pastor with the Calvary Chapel, was, was at one point, and, and he said it this way, I'm afraid that people have too much Jesus to be happy in the world, but too much world to have joy in Christ. There's this danger when we, we think we can survive and live in what the world has to offer. We're in pursuit of what the, uh, what the world has for us. But we forget the joy is only found in Christ. And the more we lean into the worldly things, the harder it is to remember that gospel joy, that good news that came into my life. And so I think as David writes, he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Let your spirit keep that joy alive in me. Help me not ask the question, how close can I live to the world? Instead, how can I live closer to you, God? How can I live closer to you? Restore that joy. I love this in Ephesians, speaking of the Holy Spirit. For those you and I, this I think David would have loved to have had this Scripture. And for you and I today, we get to look at what was written in Ephesians. It says this, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Do you realize that this is a gospel truth for you and I today? This should be the welling up of our joy. That when we put our faith in Christ, it says we receive the Holy Spirit. And there's two key words that stand out here. The first one, you are sealed. The gospel joy is sealed in you, in the Holy Spirit, not to be removed from you. In fact, second one, it's a guarantee of an inheritance that's waiting for you. That there's a day where you will acquire the fullness of what it means to be fully loved and fully known by God. The Holy Spirit is that guarantor. The Holy Spirit is the one that wells up in you gospel joy when you understand the salvation. So my hope and my prayer for you today as you go forward, as you begin to wrestle with How's my joy? How's the joy in my life? Have I remembered the true gospel joy or have I let the world creep in and get in the way of my joy? Perhaps in the pursuit of happiness, but at the neglect of true joy in Christ. I'm grateful for David's writing because he helps to remind us that there's hope, that we have a God who fully knows us and fully loves us. Love you guys. Can't wait to see you next time. I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors. Well, are you wrestling? Are you wrestling at all? So here's my question for you today. Where does your joy come from? If you don't yet know Christ, my guess is that your joy is truly just happiness. It's momentary. It comes and it goes. A little happiness here, a sprinkle there some sorrow, and a, and a fight and struggle to get back to happiness. And sometimes that comes through a variety of different w- ways in which we try to find happiness in relationship, in work, with money, sex, drugs. There's lots of ways we try to fill what only joy can fill. So, are you experiencing joy? If you don't yet know the Lord, I would encourage you to spend some time reading through the psalm and perhaps turning your attention to God and confessing that you need Him. But if you do know the Lord, I encourage you to evaluate how's your joy doing? And where do you need to be reminded that you're pure because of Christ? That you've been declared righteous because of Christ? And then that joy should well up in you despite your circumstances. And I know there are tough seasons out there. So don't think that this is just a cliche phrase, just get over it. But sometimes we do need to get through it to remind ourselves where our joy really comes from and let that well up in you. 
And the second thing as we kind of enter into the Easter season, I just want to encourage you. We have the blessed rhythm. We constantly are walking through and encouraging you to be a part of where you begin in prayer. God, what do you have for me today? And then remind yourself of your joy in your prayer. And then walking through, listening to others, listening to the Holy Spirit, eating or engaging with others in relationship, serving others, being served, and sharing your faith. But as you think of that, we have one focus we'd love you to do is think about those in your sphere of influence. Maybe it's a neighbor or neighbors. Maybe it's people at workplace or in your schools. I want to encourage you to write their names down, put it in a place, and daily lift them up in prayer. If they need to know the Lord, present them to God and look for opportunities to share. If they know the Lord, but maybe they're struggling, pray for them that their joy would be restored. Love you guys. I hope that uh, this blesses you today. Look forward to seeing you next time.